All right, my guest today is Ed Cohn, and he is regarded in my mind, as well as many, many others, as the greatest power lifter of all time. He has set over 71 world records in powerlifting. He has squatted 1,019 pounds, bench pressed 584 pounds. He has deadlifted 901 pounds. And his deadlift, when he did it, was just with a singlet and a belt. So today that would be considered raw by today's standards. Only one term comes to mind when we talk about Ed Cohn, and that is the GOAT. He is the greatest of all time. Welcome to the show, Ed Cohn. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you guys having me. Oh, it's great to have you. And I think that you are going to be able to inspire and encourage all those listening today to go to a higher level, not only in their training, but also in their lifting and their living. And, you know, it's so interesting. And I, it, this still blows me away all the time to think about when you started out lifting, you were four foot 11, you weighed 98 pounds and you were able to transform yourself into a powerhouse. Can you share with us how and why you started lifting? And then when you kind of knew there, was, there had to have been a point where you knew you had a knack for powerlifting? Um, I'd say, uh, well, I started lifting right before I went to high school because I was 4'11", 98 pounds. And I was kind of small to go out for football. So I went out for wrestling because it was a 98-pound class. And then I saw Pumping Iron on TV with Arnold, <laughs> like a gazillion other people. So I started lifting with a friend of mine named Kenny Rice and a, another guy named Jim Nichols in in the basement with some machines and a little bit of weights. Well, when I saw um, – I met Arnold in person at a Sears store, a big box, you know, store. And he had his book out. So I was a little kid, and I walked up to him, but my head was right in his chest. <laughs> and I was like, oh, darn. I can't be Arnold. So I tried to be Franco, his little sidekick, because Franco was strong in my height. And um, so I, I started I started doing a bunch of bodybuilding stuff. And then when I ended up going back to wrestling, I didn't want to because I was already 135 pounds of steel. And I felt big already, and there was no way I was going to die back down to like 105 or 112 after being so huge as I thought of myself. And I just kept going, but I went to my first bodybuilding contest, and I, I just didn't enjoy it that much. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw Bill Kazmaier on TV at a powerlifting nationals. So I watched the whole thing, and I was like, well, wait. You can be that big, that strong, not have to diet that hard or worry about posing on stage. I get to lift really, really heavy weights. This is my stuff now. <laughs> and I just, and I just, it just took off. I squatted twice a week and maxed out both days till I hit 500 pounds. Incredible. And you know, we talk about lifting weights. I think anybody that bought that book when we were younger, uh, the, is it the education of, of a bodybuilder? I can't remember. It's, it's so thick. It's that giant Schwarzenegger book that's got a million different exercises. I tried every one that's in there at some point when I was younger. Yeah, just, <laughs> I tried every one in one night. I thought that was the whole routine. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that was a three-hour workout of nonstop. I mean, that was a monster, monster book. And so – you know, you think about this, you were squatting 500 pounds. How old were you when you were squatting 500? Uh, 16. At 16 years old. And in its legit squat, I was just having a conversation before you came on is that, you know, what uh, high school students count as a squat anymore and what the internet counts as a squat is not what I would call a squat. So it was legit. No. And, you know, here's one of the things that I thought was so interesting is, you have such a strong family background growing up and strong faith. How did that affect your training and your work ethic? Uh, I, I had the support of my parents and actually the support of my siblings and my friends all thought it was really, really cool because it was something that they'd never seen or done before. Um, and then the rest is just, it's pretty much me because I was a little 
little ADD with and very introverted when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. So it was something I could do and get into myself. But at the same time, I believe I I got so good because I was able to sit back and observe and really suck everything in because I wasn't the talkative guy. I was really shy. So that enabled me to have a, a different gift. And I think that was that's what played out. Yeah, you know, so many kids today, so many adults, they don't have those strong family members in their life that will encourage them and, you know, be there for them, help them to pursue their dreams. And I, I thought that was so interesting. And um, checking some pictures out, and I've always thought these were amazing. Before the Tiger King, there was Ed Cohn. Um, what was it like to drive with a tiger in your car? What kind of reactions did people give you when you were driving? I think was the Cub named a, Jade. Yeah, there was Jade and Pearl. Okay, they were both Siberians. Um, Jade Jade was really nice. Died young, but uh, I'd have I'd have him in the back of the Ford Explorer in a giant a giant um, dog cage when he was only about like two hundred fifty pounds. And that was pretty cool, especially if you park and have the window open and the people around you hear a sound. <laughs> and that that was a really good tiger. The white one was uh, Pearl was enormous. I used to take it home with me and play with it. It would do things I wanted, but take naps with me. I it's still a tiger though. <laughs> and I. I had pretty much, you know, they ended up going into breeding programs, but after I hadn't seen it in a while, I, I went back and saw it a, a two and a half years later. And when the last time I had seen it was a little over 300 pounds. And I looked at the end of a warehouse. It was this huge long run cage. And I kept looking and I couldn't see it. And the guy goes, see that couch? That's Jade. Oh my goodness. It was the size of a couch. Oh my goodness. And he got a whiff of me and just ran across the whole length of the whole warehouse till he got to the fence and then jumped up. And I swear everyone thought the fence was going to get knocked down. <laughs> and he just kept purring back and forth until they let him out. And uh, then all was fun and dandy again. Yeah, the bonding. Yeah, like seven, seven foot tall, almost 900 pounds at that point. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, that that is amazing. Um, you know, I, I think this is something, especially we have a lot of young listeners. We kind of run the gamut here. We got a lot of young athletes as well as a lot of older athletes. What kind of commitment does it take to be a champion? Because I don't think people really understand um, that this was not a hobby for you. This was a lifestyle. And can you share with us like what the typical week looked like when you were competing? Sure. I, w- I would train uh, five days a week. I believe it was uh, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And um, I just split up the training on different days. And I, I really just never looked back. You know, people act like, what What did you give up? Well, I didn't like to drink. I still went out with my friends. Um, I didn't give up anything I gained. So every time I went to the gym, I was doing something that I absolutely loved that made me feel good. So that was a reward. That wasn't, I never took anything away. Mm -hmm. That was my passion was everything I loved. And it led to a lot of really, really cool things. Yeah. I I think a lot of people don't understand that, you know, once you get the bug, it's just the feeling of the iron in your hands there's something about it. You know, I'm, I'm getting older. I'm 48 right now, but I still get jacked every time I get to go in my dungeon and, you know, be able to lift those weights. It, j- there's something about the feel of the iron. And like you say, it's a passion. It is. It, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of people understand it, but it's almost like a, a spiritual thing for me because it's like what it takes and what it takes out of your body, the emotion, the spiritual side of it. it it's so intense. And your lifts are absolutely legendary. I mean, like I said, you're the goat. And what I'd like to talk about is this. What do you think, in your opinion, are some of the most underutilized assistance exercises? You know, it's like uh, my friend John Brookfield, one time we were talking, 
you know, if somebody says, what's the best exercise for somebody who's a field goal kicker? Well, it's kicking field goals. So obviously the best exercises for the power lifts are, you know, the power lifts themselves. But what are some of the underutilized assistance exercises and what should people spend less time on and what should people spend more time on in their training? Now, John was like the grip guy or the Highland Games guy? The grip guy. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> actually, the most underutilized is your brain. Ooh, I, I love swear. It. I love it. I swear. Everything happens in your brain before it can happen in your body. You know, Kaz used to say, conceive, believe, achieve. And that's the truth. But first, you got to get it in your head, but you got to be able to visualize it. And I was able to visualize it, but I could feel and know how it was supposed to feel every single step of the way. So I knew what to expect in my mind. And is I knew I had to get from point A to, you know, Z. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that was to write out my routine and specifically have every single set, rep, exercise and weight listed on it for every single exercise the whole way through 10 12 14 weeks whatever it was and stick to it because i rewrite it like 20 times till i got all the numbers right they had to be doable mm -hmm. and each week led to another week but it was always doable and i knew that if i followed the rule the rule which was, you know, of me, of following the routine exactly. You know, they say adhering to the plan and all this stuff now. Um, the outcome would be exactly what I wrote down. So confidence walking in mentally was excellent. So that that's the big part of the battle right there. And then I realized that all I got into this thing was for was to get bigger and stronger. And I love it. So... If I screw up, I'm not going to be able to get to do what I love for a really, really long time. So it's kind of like um, if you take your time when you're young or old and think about what you're going to do and what is your purpose to doing everything you do, if you stick with that, you'll get along just fine with the weights and the weights will treat you back nicely. I did like four to five training cycles a year and I tried to make a little progress in each one. And that means every single exercise I'd make progress in. So it's not just a squat bench deadlift. I got every single exercise I did better. So when you look at that after a few years, you just don't have a strong legs and hips. You don't just don't have a strong chest or triceps. Your whole body is this giant suit of armor that wherever you hit, there's a big chunk of muscle and strength. So if you do that, a little bit of progress for a long, long, long time, you're going to be pretty good. I love that. And like some of the assistance lifts I've heard of you doing like insane amounts are especially the bent over rows. I mean, yeah. how, how many bent over rows would you do like in a, in a session? And, and for people that don't understand bent over rows, I'd also like to have your opinion on body English because a lot of people are scared to do it because they say, well, I jerk it up. I mean, what's more important, doing the movement or is it the form of that movement? Um, first, doing the movement. And it's easy to correct. I used to have some swing in it. Mm -hmm. My body would go down with it, but I wouldn't touch. Mm -hmm. So I would maintain a certain angle like a linebacker a little bit but I would move down a little bit, but I would completely stretch and let go of my shoulders and stretch it out, then pull. What that did is it's twofold there, or threefold. Uh, besides building a big, huge, thick back, it gets extremely strong. And to be able to hold yourself up when you let the weight down and don't touch, your core gets strong, the real core, not your abs, from the front to the sides to the back, everything is equal and your body adapts to that. You don't core. Isn't just to have pretty abs. That's just a bunch of crap. <laughs> Amen. to that. You know, and that's just so important. And you know, one of the things that I know you used to advocate and I don't know if you still do, I'm just curious because I, I think it's a good exercise is, is the press behind the neck. 
you know, I know that you used to do a lot of those. Do you still advocate that? Yeah. The, the problem people have, <coughs> excuse me, with a lot of stuff behind the neck, whether it's pull downs or, you know, you see pullovers were supposed to be bad and behind the neck presses. But what they do is they've never done them before and they just go right into seeing how heavy they can go. Mm-hmm. Instead of realizing you get, have to get a certain amount of mobility in, a, in an exercise to make it your own. So your body and mind work together and know how to deal with it or else you get hurt. And that's usually what happens. I love that you touched on that is making the exercises your own, finding your own groove. Um, one of the things that you're famous for is, you know, being able to do two styles of deadlifts, you know, the sumo deadlift. How did that all come about? Like when did you kind of discover the sumo deadlift and, and that it could be really used for huge leverage? I, it was, it was early on. I knew that how strong and how developed my back got from doing conventional stuff. So I didn't want to let go of that because my main objective in the gym was to be big and strong. We mm-hmm. go back to when I was little. And then I realized because, you know, I've got a longer torso with big, long arms, but I got legs like a Oompa Loompa. So the Eddie Cohen hybrid stance was just the Eddie Cohen sumo. That's all it was. But I noticed that doing it that way, I could get some leg dri- extra leg drive and be able to pull it like a conventional. So my whole off season was nothing but deficit stiff leg deadlifts with no belt and deficit conventional deadlifts with no belt. And that helped my sumo more than anything. I only needed like six sumo workouts before a, a meet to make it mine. Yeah, and then let me ask you this. This is like... Um just personal preference for me in training, I, I really rather train without a belt. I find that my form is better and I hardly ever use a belt unless it's like crazy level poundages. What would you describe to, you know, younger lifters who think, you know, they got to go out and get gear right away. They got to get the best belt, get this. How important is, um, learning to learn the exercise without help, first i mean i think you know everybody wants a good pair of wraps and all these different things but i see these young people you know they're hardly putting any weight on the bar and they're already using knee wraps and everything else at that point um how proficient does somebody need to be before they start adding uh, gear to their program well first you have to develop a big strong base and as you said until it becomes dangerous and changes your form you don't really need that kind of stuff you end up developing weaknesses because of the too, too much use of it. Um, especially for youngsters, they should be worried about doing a, a power bodybuilding type routine mm-hmm. and that's it. They don't have a base yet. They're not qualified to go up to that level to where they should be using all that stuff. It's not for everyone says, Oh, it's for safety. No, it's not <laughs> for safety. It's to lift more weight. Absolutely. You're just going to get hurt with more weight. Yeah. I mean, so if you don't understand the, the oh, that's a whole nother thing, but you know, the whole purpose of gear. Um, but w- let's talk about this. You, you, you touched on already the mental side of powerlifting. One of the things I think you will always be known for and, and just be a legend in is your ability not to get mentally over aroused early. And you had the ability just to go and flip the switch when you hit the platform. I mean, you even can, you competed one time with a torn bicep. I mean, you talk yeah. about mental toughness. How important is the mental side to powerlifting? <laughs> if you don't believe in yourself, there's no way you'll be able to do it. Uh, walking up to a bar and saying, I'm going to try this, and walking up to a bar and, and saying, I'm going to do this are two way to, two different things. Um, trying is usually an excuse for people that don't really do it. They just say, I tried like a diet. Um, You don't put yourself in that spot where you have enough confidence that you know, you could do it. Either your routine is wrong or you have to work on your mental capabilities. Usually it's because the routine is wrong by doing a routine and hitting your numbers all the time and getting stronger and stronger and not missing is what develops a positive mental attitude by choosing wrong numbers in the wrong routine and trying to max out all the time and pushing it. 
that only brings upon a negative thought in your brain associated with lifting and this lift all the time. Yeah, I mean, just watching, you know, because so many people psych themselves out and rather than psych themselves up and, you know, starting the day out, you know, a meet is a long day. There's a lot that happens. And I, I just hope that people can take some of this advice that you have of how important that is, is to know and trust your training. You know, I, I, that's what I feel like you're saying is that I put the time in, you know, the, the, the meat is the icing on the cake. I've already done the work, you know, and now it's time to be rewarded for that work. Yeah, I'll, it, totally, totally. It's, um, I think the youngsters, because we didn't have social media back then, I think that was actually a gift because I didn't let anyone get into my own head and I didn't have to max out every week and do crazy stuff just for the sake of some followers. Yeah. And let, I want to talk about that because how has the internet changed strength training? I mean, I really enjoy the stuff that you've done with Mark Bell and super training, but it seems like today, everybody who's touches a barbell as an expert you know they don't have to have any credentials how has that changed the the strength training world in your opinion for the most part it's 90 something percent better because they got it out there mm -hmm. so many crossfitters compete in powerlifting now so many powerlifters train crossfitters and everyone knows what a squat bench and deadlift is now they know it. You don't have to be a powerlifter to do it. When the first time I went over to Australia to do a se some seminars, I went to their nationals, and they had a huge amount of women there just to compete on one day, that were sitting around walk walking and talking and having fun, and they did it because they enjoyed it. Not it wasn't like I got to compete in powerlifting. They did it because of the way it made them feel. What it made their their self-esteem with how their body looked and felt to them and an accomplishment. So if you transfer that over to younger, younger boys and girls, look what a start it gives them as far as confidence and, and their ability to know who they are. Absolutely. And you know, one, that's one of the things I think is so interesting before we had a lot of people doing these things on the social media. And like I said, some of it to me is a little dangerous because yeah, everybody claims to be an expert and wants to tell everybody how to do it. But uh, one of the things that has become so important is for people to understand that powerlifting is not going to make you fat. It's not going to make you, you know, I think so many people are scared of it. They don't realize that it's one of the, these three lifts are some of the biggest transformational lifts you can do in your life. You know, instead of just hitting, you know, 500 different machines, these lifts will actually transform your body. And to see that message out there, I think, is so good, especially amongst women. I don't think there's ever been a time I've seen more women powerlifting than they are no. today. I mean, look at the, 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 powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting. It's incredible. Um, the unfortunate part is that the people usually get to see only the super heavyweights. Mm -hmm. They forget about the little guys that are ripped to shreds or the guys – from 198 up to 242 or even 275 that are freaking jacked with abs that look incredible. They look like a tank and they only show the super heavies because they usually have the biggest lift and most super heavies. I mean, you're always going to be over 300 pounds and some of the best are over 400 pounds. So people look at that as saying, Oh no, they're just too big or they're too fat. Not realizing that some, even the super heavyweights are, some unbelievable athletes. Absolutely. Not just fat. Oh, absolutely. They're using that more mass to push more weight, you know, but you watch these guys that are in the lighter classes and the women that it's just incredible. Like they are just chiseled because that's what powerlifting can do to your body. It's amazing. What a gift uh, yeah, we've been given to. It, it always gives, it doesn't take unless you're an idiot. Yep. I love it. So, you know, going kind of the, the, the gamut here, what are some mistakes that you think that beginners make? Because again, because popularity or powerlifting is growing in its popularity, you know, the message has been out there more and more. Somebody that says, okay, I'm going to start training the squat, the deadlift. I'm going to start training the bench press. What are some mistakes that they need to look out for? 
the the first thing they do is they they try to go too fast. They don't take their time, and then that causes other problems like technique issues. And then they try to go too heavy, and that's when little injuries and they then they they usually usually it's about like. 60 to 70 percent of the way through with the training program that day was easy so they change the next week which then changes the outcome and then they have a bad day they miss they don't like the way they look because they never really complete a whole workout and then they get really frustrated or hurt and they say this routine sucks and i usually say no you suck Go back to the drawing board. That's why I, that's why it took so many times writing it out a routine until I got it right in my head that I knew I could do this. And it was always written in paper. I could erase something as when I started. It's no no big deal. But they watch too much of the crazy stuff on the internet and they they, they, they try to be what Larry Wheels is, who's a freak of nature. And or they try to they get all hyped up. Uh, seeing Pete Rubis deadlift in his parents' basement going absolutely crazy. Yeah, and so with that, you know, how important, and I think this is something that, you know, kind of touching on, how important is consistency? Because I, I hear a lot of people say, well, this didn't work for me, but if you're not consistent, nothing will work. You know, I, I feel like most cycles will work if you're consistent. How important is consistency in the iron game? Uh, it's probably the most important thing if you don't have motivation a day but you still go there you're still accomplishing something and in the long run when you add it all up over a longer period of time that's still a lot of work yeah it's the whole compound principle that people talk it's that compounding interest that you're doing with your body even when you don't feel like it and you know that's how you go from where you were to where you are today is just so amazing. What advice can you give to older athletes? Um, again, I'm still pretty stupid in my training. Um, I haven't dialed it back near what I need to, but what advice would you give to older athletes? Because what adaptions do they need to make to still keep getting maximum gains? They got to be careful on the intensity of the workout, too much volume and too much intensity will break you down a lot, lot further now. So I would say do shorter training cycles and don't go crazy high reps with high intensity on the main compound exercises. You can keep some of them down a little bit more and just do a, 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 and just do lower reps and get just as much work in. Yeah, it's great because I think my philosophy, I'm trying to change this. I mean, I used to have the philosophy, you know, unless they have to carry you out, you know, it wasn't a good workout. And now I'm learning to have, you know, I want to always leave just a little bit in the tank and say, I could have probably got one more rep or I could have, That's the idea. but I don't then need you keep to. Going. It's, then, then you have something to look forward to every single week and you got more confidence in your mind to keep going for that next week. And then the week after, and then the week after, and all of a sudden from when you look back, you can say, wow, I came a long way. It's amazing. Um, this is a really interesting question because what do you, you've done so much in your career. What is one thing you want people to remember you for? How do you want to be remembered? I was a really nice guy that lifted a lot of weight. I love that. I love that. It's so amazing. So what is next for Ed Cohn? What's next on your plate? We're, I'm actually having a, a friend of mine in Omaha, one of my best friends named Brett Carter. He owns a place called Omaha Barbo, and we're having the – in a, a few weeks, we're going to have the first Eddie Cohen Classic. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it's just a, l a little powerlifting. I mean, I think we have 50-something to 60 people in it. We're giving away, I don't know, five, seven, seven grand cash or something, and – uh it's going to be a really, really good time. It's not going to be all stuffy and stuff, but I mean, I'm going to be a head judge. So drudging is going to be pretty strict. Yeah. So everyone, I mean, you, you got to bring your a game and you get to possibly win a little bit of money, but you get to have a really good time. I lasted in powerlifting so long because it was always fun to me and I loved it. 
I didn't screw it up for myself. That's awesome. And let me ask you just one, one more question. It's kind of two-sided. Um, where can people find out more about you? And is there anything else that you want to share? Because I think, you know, people need, you've got so much great material out there. You know, you, if you, you can learn from the best, why not learn from the best? So where can people find more about you? And is there anything else that you'd like to share with the listeners? Today? I, I, well, I, I think the most valuable thing is experience. And you look at what does this guy, what has this guy done or who has he helped? And does he have the, the education part is okay, but there's also the education of being it right, right in there with it in the midst of everything. How long has this guy competed? I mean, are you going to take a guy that has a, a degree or are you going to take someone that has done it for 20 years? I want the guy that was been in the battle for a while. He knows how to fight. Um, most of the time it's like, what's my Instagram Ed or Eddie Cohen. Okay. And I usually announce any type I, anytime I do workshops and, you know, a few other things. Um, and I'll, I'll give tips on there occasionally, but, uh, for the most part, just Instagram. Um, and I'm just a pretty easy going guy. So I, I do have a, my old book that I had in paperback was put out on, uh, on an ebook and you can get that on, on Amazon, uh, the man, the myth, the method, uh, one of the Gillingham brothers, Wade, Wade Gillingham did that all for me. He did a fantastic job of transferring the book over to it. And you know, he's, he's definitely a good grip guy. Oh man. He's a monster gripper. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Ma- makes it look easy, which it's not, but I mean, he just no. makes it look. St- <laughs> well, that's, that's the idea. <laughs> if, if, if you watch a fighter or, a runner or a football player or a lifter or someone do it, you think it, it's really easy. Well, there's a lot of work that went on underneath that. It's like the, it's, it's like when the uh, Titanic hit the, uh, the glacier, it's, it's a small glacier on top. It was like a mile, mile long deep underneath. Yes. So you don't, you don't get to see the amount of work that went in to make it look that easy. Yeah. The, the price that's been paid and, People that are listening today, I just encourage you learn more about Ed. Um, the book is fantastic because you're going to have all the meets listed there and you can just see what it looks like. If you've never been to a meet, reading through that will help you to get ready and prepare for that. Know what to expect. Um, if you have an opportunity to learn from the best, why not? I want to learn from the goat. So make sure that you get on there and learn from Ed. I want to thank our great guest today, Ed Cohn, for investing in all of our listeners today. Well, thanks for investing in me. I appreciate it. I have fun. It's, time goes really fast when you're talking to like-minded people that are just awesome. 